so I will start um, with my presentation as announced. Um, I will talk today about legal aspects, as you can see it on this slide, um, of scientific use of data, of personal data and data in general, um, with two um, emphasis. Uh, the first one will be on research data management concerning privacy aspects with regard to GDPR. And the second one, the second topic today uh, will be dealing with copyright, or which I consider also important when it comes to the use, um, not just of personal data, but of data um, in general. Yes, so um, let us start. I think we have uh, something more than one, one hour. Um, data protection law and research data management. Of course, uh, data protection and privacy is regulated in the European Union and in Germany as well. And we have to ask ourselves, how is this regulated and how we can deal with this um, as researchers? And um, the problem here is that we have different interests. On the one hand, we have the data protection and privacy interests. Um, and on the other hand, of course, we have the interest as scientific as scientists, as research, researchers, as the most extensive use of personal data. And of course, uh, research is not just something we are doing for universities um, or for any other um, um, people. Research is something which is being conducted to promote the public interest. Um, for example, when we had this debate, in 2020, 21, about the use of personal data uh, to fight the coronavirus, to for the containment interests of the coronavirus, we had two different interests here: privacy interests as well as public um, health interests. And on the other hand, um, due to the circumstances that um, research promotes in some way the public interest, the law also says um, we must facilitate it for researchers to use personal data. So we will find um, data protection law and European data protection law as well as national data protection law, so-called research privileges, which facilitate it for researchers um, to, to use personal data. So um, as researchers, we have to find out what would be the, or what could be the most problem-free possibility um, of exchange of data shared with other researchers to make our research um, um, results public. And this is uh, what this presentation um, will deal about. And um, with regard to accessibility of data and uh, research data management, we have two points to consider. So when it comes to um, the use of data, we can generally say, okay, from a legal perspective, the use of data is free. Unless it is personal data, um, then we have the problem of data protection or privacy interest, or unless it is a result of your personal work, of your personal efforts, then we have copyright interests. And as I mentioned in the beginning, um, this uh, short, very short lecture is, is divided into two different parts. So first one, data protection law, second one, privacy, um, copyright law. And what we have to ask ourselves when it comes to the use of personal data with regard to data protection interests. Uh, when is data not only data? So when can data not be considered as free from a legal perspective, but also contains information um, about an identifiable person, which is defined um, in Article 4 um, of the GDPR. And to the copyright issue, we'll come later on. Um, because that means when it's data, not only some data set, but also personal intellectual creation, which is protected by the German copyright law. And you can see already um, that privacy law is mostly dealing with European Union law interests, whereas um, copyright law is mostly focused on national regulation, on German regulation um, of copyright interests. So why is data protection important, generally speaking? So data protection, of course, regulates for what purposes and to what extent personal data um, of another person, of a natural person, um, may be processed. And the main principle here, I will talk to you, um, I will show you all these different principles of data privacy law, which are uh, seen as the visions of every privacy regulation, which also co uh, concerns um, um, the use of, of personal data for scientific purposes. The main principle we face here um, is the so-called uh, principle of prohibition. So uh, the law generally says um, due to informed consent or due to informational self-determination, um, all companies, 
private people, research institutions are generally not allowed to use personal data. So there is a prohibition um, unless um, there is some kind of reservation of permission. And there are two possibilities uh, for this reservation of permission. On one hand, you can have the consent of the person involved, so the data subject, or and this is often not seen by many people using personal data, that you there, there are many cases where you do not need the consent, um, but you can also process personal data based on the legal basis. So the law says, well, for certain interests and public interests and so on, uh, you can use um, and personal data without having obtained a prior consent. And this is interesting for us as researchers as well. And uh, data protection regulation can be seen as a rules of the game of data processing and this, of course, when you when you apply for research, when you when you create a new research committee, um, this is a part of the ethical decision um, of of the use of data because you cannot have the use of data, sensitive personal data, possibly for many different research cases without having an adequate um, research uh, data protection management implement. So this is also an ethical few um, point of view for research and ethics committees uh, at certain universities are also asking if you apply for a research grant um, that you have in some way understood the dangers of the use of data and have implemented research data management um, procedures so it is not this is not a, just a legal um, assignment but this is also something that every researcher um, has to think of in the context of, of university work and um, when it comes to the um, um, constitutional legal foundations um, of privacy, there is a so-called right to self-determination, to informational self-determination. And this is a basic right of privacy um, everyone has to deal with. And uh, this informational self-determination right has been created a long time ago, at about 40 years ago, um, from the uh, German Federal Constitutional Court. And it is, or it stated this court uh, that each individual is generally open for himself how his personal data is disclosed and used. And this means, of course, um, that when personal data is being used, that the um, individual has also the right to revoke, for example, any consent that was obtained before and so on. So um, we have very extensive rights, constitutional rights in Germany about privacy. And we also have. Um, constitutional rights about privacy in the European Union. Um, there it is set in Article 8 of the Charter of the Fundamental Rights of the European Union that personal data is uh, specifically um, protected. I see there is the first question. How is this arranged when you have personal data from people um, abroad outside um, the European Union is asked here. So this is not um, um, a very, very simple question because um, the European uh, General Data Protection Law says that um, it is not necessary that you only use um, um, personal data of European Union citizens. So you can have people here um, which are, for example, Americans, and you process their data for any research purposes, and this falls also within the scope um, of, of the GDPR. And um, the, the scope of application GDPR is, is quite complicated. I will be I will not have the time to deal with it today in, in detail, but as to say um, that there is a very broad scope of application. So when you use just people for data from, from people abroad, this isn't you cannot be sure that GDPR is not applicable because you are using it here as um, as researcher in Germany or in any other European country. And of course, um, it is to say that there are a lot of um, foreign states that have also recently in the last years created privacy regulations. Some of them are quite similar to the European Union one. And then, of course, you have to be compliant with these regulations as well. And another topic here, which uh, I will be dealing with very shortly um, at the end of this presentation, is um, the data transfer, the transfer of personal data to um, um, third countries outside of the European Union, because you can have a transnational consortium um, where you do your research, and this might also be interesting for you. So, um, and to answer this question very shortly, um, we have a broad scope of application of the GDPR, and just uh, because you use uh, personal data from people abroad, you are not outside 
automatically outside of the scope of application of the GDPR. Um, okay. So as I mentioned, um, we have um, different constitutional um, and rights in, on the European Union as well as on the national level. But this is, of course, uh, not all. These are just uh, um, privacy basics. And um, as I mentioned, um, the German Constitutional Court um, had this judgment in 1983. And this was the first judgment where data privacy was declared as a constitutional right. And this had also some meaningful um, data operations by the state, um, data operations conducted by private companies. And this was the first uh, real judgment where um, it was seen that privacy had also some economic meanings. So personal data, of course, is a currency, is sometimes said. Some people say information is the oil of the 21st century. It is not allowed to use personal data without a legal basis. And this can, these foundations can be found um, in this law, uh, in, in this, in this um, right created by the German Constitutional Court years ago. So what can be considered uh, the main goals of the GDPR, uh, the General Data Protection Regulation as a main European data protection law? Um, we have a European data protection law since 1995, but the goal of the European Union is of course to create um, a uniform legal landscape. And this was also the goal why the GDPR was created. So uh, the creation of uniform and binding data protection legal rules, which would be applicable in all member states of the European Union. And this would, of course, facilitate um, the data exchange, not only from a scientific perspective, but from every perspective where personal data is used. And this law became effective in May 2018. And um, it is to say that when it comes to data processing, the first contact point will be the GDPR because the GDPR has the priority over national data protection laws. Um, but, this is important, but um, it is called the general data protection regulation, not the specific data protection regulation or not the data protection regulation, it's a general data protection regulation. So that means when there are general rules, there must also be some specific rules. And this is a case here. We have um, um, very specific privacy regulation for example, in the member states. And the GDPR contains so-called opening clauses. And uh, there are about 70 about them. And in these opening clauses, we will deal with some of them. The GDPR allows the member states to create their own national data protection regulations in the fields of interest where we cannot find um, uh, European um, privacy regulation. And um, in Germany, um, the German legislators so or the federal parliament made a very extensive interpretation um, of these opening clauses in the GPR. And this is why we still um, have a BDSG, which is called the Bundesdatenschutzgesetz, or in English, the German Federal Data Protection Act. And this general, uh, German General Data Federal Protection Act fills out the so-called some of these so-called opening clauses but we have also very specific privacy law and privacy regulations um, in the member states, um, in the 60 member states uh, due to federalism and so on. So um, it is to say that even though we have GDPR, um, privacy regulation has not become easier in the, in the European Union. And it is also to say that we have national authorities and GDPR says national authorities are competent um, for privacy evaluation. And when it comes to scientific research, um, um, scientific organizations such as universities um, are, are part of the um, 16 federal countries. So um, there, the um, data protection authority of these each federal country is in charge for the um, use of personal data by universities in these federal countries of Germany. And for inter interpretation, um, the European Court of Justice as last word, because of course it's European Union law, which cannot be interpreted um, um, by the by the member states, because we need a uniform approach of legal interpretation for the whole European Union. And the first question has all, has already de dealt with um, the scope of application of GDPR. One, I could tell you a lot of the scope of application. I, should, I think we could fill two or three hours just with the scope of location, but we do not have this time. So this is why I will only mention the most important things. And it is to say um, that the GDPR has a broad scope of application. And GDPR says we do not care or the European legislator does not care um, if, if personal data is being processed um, analog or in a digital way. So of course, when you 
process your data uh, computer-based in a digital way, then you fall within the scope of GDPR. But also when you have a file cabinet um, with paperwork in it and you store everything in an analog way, this is also processing of personal data because the dangers can be considered the same. So um, if someone accesses your computer and gets the data, or if someone accesses your file cabinet and gets the data, these are the same dangers. And for this reason, GDPR says, well, um, the law should be applicable both of the cases. And one of the most important questions uh, for applicability of GDPR is, when do we have, we have personal data? What does personal data mean? And we find a legal definition for personal data in Article 4. Number one in GDPR, personal data means any information relating to an identified or identifiable natural person, the so-called data subject. And um, um, this is important to, distinct, to make a distinguishment here because identified person um, is quite clear. And you find the information here, what identified person means, for example, in the last bullet point. So when you have a name, address, when you have any um, numbers, social security numbers, numbers of passports, then you have an identified person. But the more important criterion and the more difficult criterion here is the identifiable natural person. So when is a data subject can be considered as identifiable? And there the law says um, an identifiable natural person is one who can be identified directly or indirectly, in particular by reference to an identifier such as a name and identification number, location data, and online identifiers such as IP addresses, or to one or more factors specific to the physical, physiological, genetic, mental, economic, cultural, or social identity of the natural person. That means even when you do not have the clear name of a person, um, you can combine certain information, for example, location data, um, um, information about the physical appearance of a person, um, so that means biometrical data, and then you can identify someone, which is also, for example, done um, when you have video surveillance systems, which are AI controlled. This is, of course, dealing with, with uh, they have the goal to identify someone. So they are within the scope of GDPR. So we can have, have a lot of different characteristics, if, even if you do not have the clear data, which allow identification of a natural person. And this is important um, to know as well. When, when you use pseudonymized, anonymized data in the research context, because when there are still enough elements or single aspects um, to find out the natural person standing behind the data set, you fall within the scope of application of the GDPR. I think it's important to know. Um, but there are also some other principles. I will deal with them very, very shortly um, due to our time limit. So we have a principle of lawfulness, fairness, and transparency. And this is based on the whole idea uh, that we have a data subject uh, which makes its own decision whether personal data should be used or not. So um, principle of lawfulness, fairness, transparency says personal data shall be processed lawfully, fairly, and in a transparent manner in relation to the data subject. And this means um, we must inform the data subject prior to data processing what we will be doing with the data on a rich legal basis. So when you uh, think about data protection declarations, this is a legal ground why we need data protection declarations because when the data subject um, does not know anything about the use of data, how the data is being processed, which kind of data is being processed for which purposes, um, then we do not have lawfulness, fairness, and transparency. Another important principle, purpose limitation. Purpose uh, limitation means that you are not allowed to collect any data sets um, for, without having, having any purposes. So um, when the law says um, each use of personal data must have a specific legitimation, um, for example, by consent or by law, then it means that you need a certain purpose um, to define um, your processing goals. And this also means that you need to define your processing goals clearly. And especially in the research context, there is an exemption, um, which I will show you as well, which is called the broad consent, but we will come to that later on. Um, the, the other principle, data minimization, that you should use as much data as you really need. And when you have the technical possibility uh, to pseudomize, anonymize your data, you should do that. Accuracy, I think this is self-explaining. Um, that means that data sets should be correct. But I guess that's one of the most important thing in research that you act uh, with correct data sets. And um, the last two important principles, lawfulness, I mentioned this as well, you need consent or legal permission and transparency. And this is also linked um, to data protection declaration. So before processing personal data, and this is also relevant in the context of research, you must inform the data subject 
of your research interests. So which data is being used on which legal grounds, for which purposes, how long it is stored, um, if it's transferred to any third countries, if it's shared by any third parties, how you plan to publish the data and so on. So you have information obligations. Um, data subjects can also ask um, for the data sets. So that means they can make requests for information. You have transparency obligations and um, the data protection declaration must also be easy, accessible and understandable for the um, for the data subject. These are principles. So based on these principles, we get into the more concrete det details now of the data processing. So what um, are the concrete basics of data protection for research purposes in Germany and, and of course in the European Union law, because the German law has to be compliant with the European Union law. Um, and you see on this picture, um, the, these slides will be uploaded, uh, so, so you didn't have to read everything at this moment. Um, you see how complicated um, the data privacy landscape in the European Union as well as in Germany is. So uh, on the right hand side on the top, you see the Charter of Fundamental Rights of the European Union, which is uh, being considered as European primary law, constitutional law of the European Union, which prescribes um, privacy as one of the interests of the European um, primary law. And I mentioned already this, um, this Article 8 of the Charter of Fundamental Rights of the European Union, which says that privacy is of high importance, but that there are certain grounds of interest which allow the use of personal data. Based on the European... Uh, legal regulation or the primary law. Um, you have the GDPR as um, simple European legislation, GDPR, General Data Protection Regulation. And the General Data Protection Regulation, I mentioned it in the beginning, is the main uh, um, addressee when we want to um, get to know how we can use personal data. But it's a General Data Protection Regulation. And due to this opening clauses of the member states, they are still allowed in certain areas of interest to create their own respective national data protection law. And you can see it here. Um, um, of course, we have our German constitution, which is below the European law, and which says uh, privacy is a constitutional right. But based on that, we have, for example, the German Federal Data Protection Act, the BDSG, which contains very specific provisions for research data use. I will show you later on what this means, uh, especially in paragraph um, 22 and 27 of this law. And then we have um, the Data Protection Act of the federal German state. And each German state, 16 of the German states, has its own data protection law as well, which is relevant for public institutions, for example. And then we have, on the lowest level, um, very, very specific sector uh, related legislation. For example, when you want to use social data um, for your research or medical data or genetic data, um, there are special rules only for these kinds of data because um, they are collected by very specific institutions and especially the, the German social security law and the, the privacy regulations that can be found in the social security law of Germany are very difficult to understand, even for lawyers, this is to say. So you see um, the data protection landscape, even though we have GDPR as one of the main privacy laws uh, based in European Union law, it's, it's not very easy to understand. It's not very, very easy. So it's, it's, it's a difficult way on how to uh, regulate uh, the use of data. Um, and as I mentioned, um, based on the constitutional rights of the European Union, as well as in Germany, um, it is said that personal data cannot be used unless you have a legal ground. And there are two possibilities, the consent, as well as legal uh, permissions. And um, when it comes to the use of special categories of personal data, which are very important um, in, in the health data research. And um, as mentioned before, um, I'm working also um, in, the, in the field of NFDI for health. And we have a lot to do with sensitive personal data. And of course, sensitive personal data has to be protected in a special way. And um, in the GDPR, um, we find the general legitimation grounds for the use of personal data in Article 6 of the GDPR. You can find them there. It's online. Um, and we find the specific uh, legal provisions for the use of um, sensitive data sets um, in Article 9 of the GDPR. These are specially regulated. And there are two possibilities, as I mentioned, consent or um, legal permission. And we find in the, um, in the German um, Federal Data Protection Law uh, specific regulation which says 
that when um, personal data is used for scientific purposes, there exists a so-called research privilege um, in paragraph 27 of the, of the um, German federal data protection law. I will later on um, deal with this very specific provision. Um, but we've come to that. A short example, why it is, it is important when we think, for example, about health data, um, that it is necessary to have certain technical and organizational measures for data security in place as well. And this is just a sentence, but it shows uh, this real case that happened in 2016. And this was also running through the newspapers um, after the carnival par uh, parade um, patient files from a Thuringian clinic processed into confetti created a good mood among data protection officials. Patient data could be read on the snippets um, on the streets. So um, the, this clinic said, well, it would be nice to have um, old patient data used as confetti, um, but they did not shredder it enough. And as a result, you could read patient data on the streets um, of, of the city of Erfurt. So this was a major data breach. And this is something that should not happen in any case when it comes to the use of personal data, but in the case of, of, of general data and um, personal data as well. And um, when it comes to uh, research data management and the protection of special categories of personal data, we find um, some categories which are particularly protected. For example, data concerning racial, ethnic origin, political opinions, religious or philosophical beliefs, trade union membership, genetic and biometric data, data concerning health, natural person, sex life or sexual orientation, as well as data about crimes. And I consider that um, this kind of data is often used in a research context, and um, especially when it comes um, to, to, to health data, we have genetic and biometric data, which is also relevant here and which is specially um, protected. But you can see um, these are not the only kinds of data that are specially protected um, by the law. And you find a legal definition um, of sensitive kinds of personal data in Article 9, um, Paragraph 8, of the GDPR, where every kind of personal data um, that is sensitive um, is being defined um, by the law. So this is a, um, a short excerpt um, of Article 9 of the GDPR. And you see already, um, as I mentioned, that we have the definition of special categories of personal data, processing of personal data, revealing racial, ethnic origin, political opinions, religious or philosophical beliefs, or trade union membership and the processing of genetic data, biometric data for the purpose of uniquely identifying for natural person, that means personal data, concerning health or data concerning um, natural person's sex life or sexual orientation shall be prohibited. This is a general principle. So you are not allowed to use this kind of data, but it is said afterwards, and this is a classic formulation in, in the legal system. Uh, on, on, on the, you will find the, the, the main decision um, in, in the first paragraph or the first sentence afterwards, you will find the exceptions. And this is the same case here for Article 9, because in paragraph 2, it is said, paragraph 1, so this principle of prohibition shall not apply if one of the following applies. For example, the data subject has given explicit consent on the processing that those um, um, personal data might be used for specific purposes. Um, and these specific purposes can, of course, also be research um, purposes. There is a lot to take care about uh, to take care of when you when you create a consent form. And um, we in NFDI for Health um, we have created some um, um, well some some ways on how you can um, on how you can consent um, we have created some guidelines about that uh, which should be accessible um, on our website but there are a lot of things that you have to consider when you create a consent form especially uh, the purposes for which you want to use the data later on um, and sometimes it is not that easy to see uh, which concrete research purposes you might have and for this reason um, um, we have um, uh, another exception here which is, which is called the broad consent and I will show you what the broad, broad later on. Um, but when it comes to the processing of personal for research purposes and especially special, special categories of personal data, you have these possibilities that I've given by law on how to legitimate data processing. Um, and these uh, purposes can 
all be found in Article 9, Paragraph 2 of the GDPR. You have seen prior to the slide, Article 9, Paragraph 1, containing the uh, definition of, of um, sensitive personal data. And these are the legal interests as well as the consent for the use of personal data, of, of special categories, personal data, um, for example, also without having the consent. Firstly, the consent, of course, but you can also use the data um, for reasons of labor law and social law, for the protection of vital interests of patients, for example. So if someone um, is, has no consciousness um, and, and um, is brought to, to a hospital and immediate treatment is needed, then, of course, uh, the doctor can also um, access his, his vital, his patient data. Data obviously made public. I think this is also important in a research um, context because um, there are some people um, who've cre who have created blogs about their illnesses. Um, they're sharing um, sensitive information, for example, about their sexuality online. And when this is done, um, um, then it, the law says, well, if someone makes his sensitive data public, um, the person automatically says a special protection for this personal data is not needed anymore. And for this reason, um, the law then says, um, this kind of data is not be considered anymore um, as personal, uh, as, as sensitive personal data, but as general personal data. So we have to not have to follow just the general principles of data privacy. And that means not Article 9 of the GDPR, but Article 6 of the GDPR. Um, fifth point here, enforcement of legal claims. I think this is not interesting for us, but point, research purposes says explicitly um, you do not need a consent for research, research data processing, even if you use sensitive personal data, when the processing is required on the basis of EU or EU member state law for archiving, uh, achieving purposes of public interest, for scientific or historical research purposes, or for statistical purposes. So we find a clear legitimation here to use personal data um, for research purposes without having obtained the consent before. And this is also applicable in the case of um, um, sensitive personal data, which I find very interesting because this is a broad exception that is made here because scientific research normally um, has something to do with the public interest. And for this reason, it makes sense um, um, that um, we have a special regulation um, for um, facilitation of scientific research. And when it comes to the consent, I said it already, I will not deal with the consent in detail. Um, we have provided some information on the NFDI for Health website about this, um, but there are some requirements which can also be found in the law. So the consent must be given voluntary. That means a free decision of the consenting party. The consent must be given in advance. So prior, before you start your research, of course, um, you must... Um, give information about the data processing purposes to the individual. That means the data protection declaration is needed. Um, this comes normally with the consent together. Um, you have this earmarking principle, so you might only use the data for the purposes that are being defined in the consent. And the consent, and this is very important as well, the consent must be verifiable. So um, the law does not say um, you, you need to get the consent in a certain way. When you take a look into Article 7 of the GDPR, you can, you can obtain the consent from the data subject in any way. So you can have it via phone, orally, um, in writing, um, if someone has to sign a paper electronically, for example, via email. Um, but you, um, and this is also applicable for researchers, um, you are being considered as a, as a person um, or as an as a, as a, as institution that is in charge um, for data privacy. And you have to um, make clear that you have obtained the consent before. So your consent must be very viable. So that means um, you normally should um, obtain the consent in writing or at least um, in electronically form, an electronic form so that you are able um, to prove that someone has given the consent for your research, because otherwise um, you would do, possibly you would do the research without any legal grounds, and this would be very bad. Um, and what is also important to know about the consent, and this is also prescribed by Article 7 GDPR, which regulates the general consent of use of personal data. Um, the data subject has also the right to withdraw the consent in any time for the future. That means 
um, when you base your data processing just on the consent and someone withdraw its consent and you have still um, a personal data of this person, then this personal data must be deleted for the future. The, the, um, the data use that has um, taken place in the past is not um, illegal by that, but the future data use would not be possible anymore. So for this reason, it might be interesting, of course, to see if there are any other possibilities, especially in research data processing um, for researchers to use personal data without having obtained um, the consent. Before we come to that, I would like to give some, some more information, um, one last information about the consent, um, the so-called broad consent. I mentioned this principle um, several slides ago. So when you do your research, uh, you have a certain idea behind your research, you have a certain goal possibly, what you want to reach with your research, but sometimes you do not know how to reach this goal, um, you do not know the concrete path on, on how to deal with the research questions, and there might be some problems occurring that had not been foreseen um, when, you, when you started your research. And for this reason, um, the GDPR says, um, well, we have understood the specific situation of researchers when they use personal data. And for them, they have the problem. They are not companies. For example, they are not using the, the data for, for marketing purposes, which are quite clear. Um, for researchers, it is often not possible to fully identify the purpose um, of the personal data processing for research purposes at the time of data collection. This might be the case. And I think this is quite often the case. And um, and therefore, um, Resolute 33 of the GPRs, data subjects should be allowed to give their consent in areas of scientific research when in keeping with rec recognized ethical standards for scientific research. For example, when your um, research pro project has been acknowledged by an ethical standards board and when you have shown that, for example, you have inter integrated enough data security measures and so on, um, then you can say, okay, um, my research goal is quite clear, but I'm not sure um, which, in which way I will use the data, which concrete way I will have to use the data to, to get to this research goal. And then the GDPR says, okay, is is okay to obtain a so-called broad consent for certain areas of scientific research um, when you are not able um, to define the concrete um, conditions for consent in the time um, when you collect the data. And, um, and it's also said in this Resident 33 that data subjects should have the opportunity to give their consent only to certain areas of research or parts of pro research projects to the extent allowed by the intended purpose. So you're in some way, you have the broad consent, but again, you're limited uh, by the intended use of the data. So you cannot say I collect the data for this research project and possibly I will use the data also for any other research project that might be connected to this in the next 10 years. So this would not be um, um, linked to the broad consent anymore, but you do not have to um, be very, very concrete when receiving the consent. So to receive the consent for certain areas of scientific research is sufficient. And this is a privilege that can only be found in research data management and not, for example, when you use the data for any business purposes, such as companies, because research data, again, research data processing is considered, uh, is conducted in the public um, interest. And um, as I mentioned before, um, there are several um, um, possibilities for researchers um, to use personal data in a privileged way. And this is also prescribed um, by, the, by the GDPR when it comes to the use of special categories of personal data. And there we find a reference that is made to Article 89 um, and paragraph one of the GDPR as well as member state law. And um, now we will take a closer look into these research data privileges, which are very specific cases uh, for research. So on one hand, you have article 89, and on the other hand, you have the um, paragraph 27 of the GDPR. I won't read this um, all here. It's just uh, important for you to see um, um, the headline here, um, safeguards and derogations relating to processing for um, ar achieving um, purpose in the public interest, scientific or historical research purposes um, or um, statistical purposes, which says that um, there are certain safeguards and derogations um, for the use of personal data for research purposes. Safeguards means 
um, that you have to implement certain measures of data security, for example. But on the other hand, you as a researcher receive some derogations of classic um, data protection law, which is called the research privilege and which make it easier for you um, to use personal data um, for in terms of reach, um, research. So uh, firstly, it is said, when you're a researcher, and this is part of every um, check of an ethics committee of research, you have to implement technical and organizational measures for the physical protection, the technical protection of your personal data. So um, it's set here in Article 89, a special regulation for scientific purposes for the use of personal data, that processing requires appropriate safeguards for the rights and freedoms of the affected persons. And this can be reached, these safeguards, through, uh, through so-called suitable guarantees. So you must be able, as a researcher, to provide um, technical and organizational measures. So you must find out which data is really necessary for me um, to, re um, to, to reach my research goal. So the principle of data minimization, which I mentioned at the beginning, can be found here. Um, you must be able to ensure as a um, researcher that you keep the data confidential. So that means um, not everyone can access the data. You must uh, keep up the integrity of the data so that not everyone who is possibly unauthorized can change the data. And um, where possible um, and where it is um, compliant to your research interests and research goals, um, you must pseudonymize the data or better anonymize the data. Because when you have anonymized data, um, these data sets do not fall within the scope of the GDPR. So that means you do not have to fulfill all the duties that are prescribed by the GDPR. But um, it is important to know that even um, the technical procedure of anonymization of personal data is being considered as use of personal data. So that means, firstly, you have to collect the data sets. And they can be considered, for example, as, as um, um, personal data sets. And then you have certain measures um, where you delete identifiers so that you get anonymized data. And this procedure um, is already considered as a use of personal data. So even if you have the goal of anonymization, of complete anonymization, you're firstly normally using personal data. So when you start with your um, processing operations for research purposes, um, you fall within the scope of GDPR. This is an important thing to know. Um, and the distinguishment between pseudonymization and anonymization techniques is quite easy. Um, pseudonymization means just you make it more difficult um, to relate data sets to concrete people. So you still want to have the possibility um, to access um, the real information, the real names, for example, uh, which standing behind a data set. But you say, I separate, for example, uh, identifiers from laboratory data. So. Uh, you say that the personal reference is only possible um, with the inclusion of any kind of additional information. Um, another technique, so um, to, to, to come to conclusion uh, with regard to pseudonymization, when you use pseudonymized data, you still use personal data because um, the reference is made difficult, but it's still possible. And this is also the goal of pseudonymization. Anonymization means that you completely remove any personal references of the data sets. And these personal references are also permanently revoked. So um, you, you delete any identification feature of the data. Um, when you have, generally speaking, anonymized data, this does not fall within the scope of the GDPR. But um, you have the task um, to regularly check if the data sets can still be considered anonymous data sets because you can have evolving technologies such as AI, um, big data, data warehousing, where a lot of data is put together. Um, and even if you delete personal information such, such as clear names, it might be possible um, to find out if you combine certain data sets who is standing behind uh, a certain data set. So you as a researcher have the duty to check regularly whether the data can still be considered um, as anonymous. Um, and there's also a problem when you have, for example, very small data sets. So for example, you only have five to 10 people. Um, you have um, um, asked in a study and they have given some personal information to you. Then it is, even if you do not use the name of the people in your research, um, it might be critical to say the data is anonymized because when you have such a little amount of people that have been asked in a study um, due to all these individual information which has been collected, it might be possible to identify the person as well. So there 
a lot of open questions concerning anonymization technologies, um, but you have this general distinguishment from a legal perspective between anonymization and um, pseudonymization. And anonymous information, as I already announced, is so is, can be considered as common um, um, property because the GDPR says uh, anonymized data is information that does not relate to, a, uh, to an identified or identifiable natural person or to personal data rendered anonymous in such a manner that the data subject is not or no longer identifiable. And I mentioned this um, again. Uh, I mentioned this again. So. Um, the degree of anonymization is certainly important. Um, and we have to ask ourselves the questions as, as researchers, is anonymity um, in the age of big data, of AI um, um, use of data really possible? And I think this is a very valid question, but this question has not been answered so far yet uh, by legal scientists when it comes to research data management. So we cannot have, not have um, um, a uniform um, decision here, which might be applicable to all um, different cases where research data um, is really used. Um, when it comes to the research data management, I, I already talked about the um, um, well restrictions of the data use on, on one hand. And then on the possibilities um, of the of the um, researchers to use personal data and certain um, safeguards that are not that are not applicable in the use of um, research data, and um, the law says if we have a researcher that is doing research for for legitimate purposes. Um, the rights of the data subjects can be restricted or denied. And the rights of the data subject um, are a very important thing in GDPR because normally everyone um, has the right to access the data, has the right to rectification, restriction to processing, um, um, right to data portability, for example, right to object to the data processing. And the GDPR says um, research is privileged. And when a researcher has uh, assured that um, technical and organizational measures for data security um, are granted to the data subject, then in certain cases, the data subject does not have these extensive data subject rights. So research data management is privileged here because normally um, it is very difficult um, for, for companies as well as, well as for natural persons um, to fulfill all these uh, rights of affected persons. Um, for example, anyone could come to you and say, well, um, please give me my information that is stored um, in your research institution about me. And when you have uh, implemented uh, technical and organizational safeguard, which are considered adequate by the law, you can say, well, um, we have this research data management priv uh, privilege, which says that um, you do not have any rights as a data subject anymore. And this is important because it facilitates um, the use of, of data um, for research in a very, um, in a very big way. Um, we do not find research data uh, privileges in, um, in GDPR, but also in, in general national data protection regulation. And there with regard to German Federal Data Protection Act, which says um, for when it comes to data processing for purposes of scientific or historical research and for statistical purposes, I've copied the whole um, um, section here into this into the slide. Um, um, for, as, as a follow-up, possibly, if you want to read the slide again. Um, and the law here says, when it comes to uh, data protection and research data management, the consent is not required, which is normally always required, for special categories of personal data if the public interest outweighs the personal data of the data subject. And here, um, of course, um, you have to make your own decision whether these interests outweigh uh, the interests of the data subject. And this should not be done um, only by you as a researcher. You should also take into account uh, the data privacy department or your uh, data protection officer in your research institution as well when you want to um, base your um, um, research data use uh, on section 27 of the uh, German federal data protection law. And it's also important to know that especially in the case of health data, you have some more regulations which guarantee the privacy of the data, such as um, the professional code of conduct um, for doctors um, 
or, and they are also criminally relevant um, duties of confidentiality, which are, can be found in the German criminal law. So that means um, the data protection per perspective might be just one perspective about how to deal with data and how to legitimize the use of personal data. There might also be uh, some other perspective when it comes uh, to sensitive personal data or when it comes to the very specific use um, of health data. And so you see here, again, we have a general principle and then we have some um, exceptions. But you can already see that when, when, when data, personal data is being processed for research reasons, there are um, very specific um, regulations um, which make it easier for researchers to use personal data for these um, um, circumstances. And lastly, um, before um, we have the short Q&A session about privacy law and continue uh, with a short introduction um, into, um, into the so-called Urheberrecht, um, we will be um, dealing with the important question of who is in charge um, for research data processing and what happens if personal data um, is being um, transferred um, to any third countries outside of the European Union. And this, these are relations um, that are also relevant um, in the context of researching. And the problem we face as researchers is that we do not work mostly on individual pro projects where we are just one person or where just our research institution is involved. We often have so-called joint Projects. So we have big consortia where um, several institutions work together. Um, when all these institutions are out of the European Union, we do not have a problem. But sometimes we have international consortia where um, a lot of different research institutions and in universities, private institutions have to work together on one um, um, research project. And um, the association partners might be assigned um, to different legal areas. So you can have, for example, universities um, um, to which state law applies, but you can also have private associations, companies, and other private organization uh, you work together with where federal law applies. And another problem here is um, that you have sometimes in this uh, collaborative research projects, it is difficult to define who is the responsible um, legal person or natural person in charge um, of all these uh, data protection duties. And normally it can also be said that every um, research institution, university collects its own data and then sometimes they are merged and put together. And for this reason, um, Article 26 of the GDPR says that there is a joint responsibility. So um, um, when you have different um, single actors um, collecting data, compiling data sets, um, then um, they have to um, create an agreement, which can be found in Article 26 of the GDPR, the so-called Joint Responsibility Agreement. Um, but the problem here is, in practice, um, that the implementation of this agreement is very complica complicated because, um, as I mentioned before, the, these project partners might be sitting in different countries. They might be public institutions, private institutions, so they're not subject to a harmonized legal regime. And for this reason, it is important for researchers um, to, to define um, before they do their research who is in charge and uh, how, to how to deal with this joint responsibility. And this has also to be conducted not by the researchers themselves, but uh, with regard to the legal and data protection departments of their respective um, university. Last but not least, um, data um, transfer to third countries outside of the European Union. When you transfer data as a researcher to any other European member state, this is not, not problematic um, because we have a uniform data protection law, the GDPR, but it is getting problematic when you transfer data to any country outside of the European Union because here the legal safeguards of the GDPR are not um, applicable. And this can already be the case when you use, for example, Microsoft 365 um, in your research, um, Excel, Word. Um, when you use cloud computing, that means when you store um, research data sets, personal information somewhere in the United States, um, and then special um, legal safeguards uh, have to be adopted. And this is very, very, very complicated, um, frankly speaking. And this cannot also not be answered here uh, in a general way, but it is important that you have this um, 
well, that you see the problems when you transfer personal data to third countries. And um, it is also important here to define who is responsible for the data processing. And this should definitely uh, may be made clear uh, with the science law department um, and the data protection officer. So this is not a question of the single researcher, but the single researcher should be aware of it. And if there is any transfer of personal data to third countries, and not only sensitive data, any kind of personal data. And when cloud computing um, is used, when Microsoft 365 is used and research data is transferred or collected in some of these online tools, then um, the science law department as well as the data protection officer of the university must be contacted prior to this. This is important to know. Um, yeah, so... This was um, um, the, the first part um, of, of, this, of this short lecture. Second part will be a bit shorter. Um, so um, the second part um, of this short lecture is dealing with copyright law and research data management. And there are some similarities uh, that can be found with regard to um, data privacy law. So to come to a short uh, introduction, um, of course, as a scientist, our main business is the systematic pursuit of new knowledge. And for this reason, we need to use not only personal data, but general data as well. And um, from a copyright perspective, research has, of course, two sides. So on the one hand, um, existing works protected by copyright are used for the own research. On the other hand, copyrighted works are produced with or by own research results. So we, when we create our own copyrighted words, works. And um, we have to ask ourselves as researchers two main questions. How and to what extent works protected by copyright may be used in our own research when we create our own research results? And how are our own research results protected um, by the German national copyright law. And as I mentioned, this is a, a perspective not mostly dealing with European law, but only um, national state law. And um, we have, when we roll back to the beginning of this presentation, we said, okay, data is free unless it is personal data and so on, or unless it is work. It is a result of personal work, which has something to do with copyright. And the copyright law says when data it's not only just some data, but also personal intellectual creation. And the, the question we have to ask, when do we reach this level of personal intellectual um, creation according um, to the German law? And uh, when it comes to the use of, um, of this kind of data, which might be copyrighted, um, I mentioned the similarities to data privacy law. So you can have a license, um, to use copyright work, or you can have some way of a legally permitted use. And there um, we find, again, some exceptions for uh, scientific purposes, um, which go beyond uh, the classic limitations um, of the German copyright law. Um, and I will come to that um, very shortly. So to start with some definitions, which are always important um, with regard to law. So what is considered work by law? A work is a personal spiritual creation that has a certain degree of peculiarity, originality, or individuality, and which can be perceived with the senses. So um, there's a broad definition um, of the work. So everything can be protected um, by copyright, but it must have a certain unique um, character. That also means that we are, when you have just mere ideas or thoughts, so when you say, okay, I could do a research about this and that and talk about your colleague with that, this, of course, is not protected by copyright. Um, because a work uh, needs a certain hate of creation, a certain um, unique character. And, um, and the, the, the problem is here on how to identify this unique character. And, and the law here again says that the work has to stand out from the masses of everyday work by merely manual or routine work. So um, um, for, for scientific researchers, this means that the copyright protection normally begins when the intellectual knowledge has become a work. So for example, in the form of a publication. So your ideas must be, they must not be written down, but they must in some way be um, defined, they must in some way be clear. And this is normally, of course, done in a form of uh, publication. And sometimes you always uh, read the, the little C uh, symbol um, that is being used by many people, not only by researchers, to say that the work um, is, is copyrighted or that it is, might be copyright protected. But 
um, the creation, the legal creation of the copyright is not tied to any other requirements. So you do not have to mark your work with a C um, to be copyrighted. Um, a copyright does also not have to be registered in some way. Um, the copyright exists by the work um, that, for example, is being published in the form um, of, a, of a, a publication. This is a case for Germany, and that means that the C symbol in Germany um, 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 is not is not um, significant here for the legal um, evaluation. And when we go further and come to the legal grounds of, of um, data processing with regard to copyright law, we have to um, find some further or define some further words here. For example, research data, what does research data mean? Can be as understood to mean all digital information that is quantitatively or qualitatively create, compiled, transformed, or analyzed within the framework of a research process. So you can have measurement data, which might be copyrighted, also texts, images, any archive uh, material. Um, the problem is that measurement data itself is not protected by copyright. So when you just have one laboratory value, this is not protected by any copyright um, because this, this value itself um, does not has not this hate of process. Um, but if you have a database which contains certain laboratory values, um, or when you have a collective work where you put certain laboratory values together, um, this is protected um, by copyright work. And um, this kind of collective collective work exists if several data sets or other elements are in any way combined. And when you have a certain kind of selection um, of the data or a certain uh, systematic overview that is being created, this all falls under the copyright law. Um, the law also defines the so-called author. The author is any natural person who creates a work uh, through personal um, intellectual achievement, because this is um, what a copyright means. Mm -hmm. And if several people create a work together, which is quite common in the scientific context, for example, through a joint publication, um, they are considered as, as co-authors and they have all respective rights uh, with regard to the work um, that has been created. And when um, it comes to the use of um, data for research purposes, uh, you have to distinguish between certain uh, possibilities to use this kind of data. So there might be free and individual licenses as well as statutory permissions. So um, normally, if you have certain kind of work which is protected by copyright, and you can normally assume that everything which is published in any way um, is protected by a copyright, um, you generally need the permission of the author unless the copyright has expired, but this cannot be seen. Normally, these are 70 years, so normally, um, the copyright has not expired. So um, you have to check firstly, um, is a copyrighted work under a free license? And when this is not the case, I will talk about later on what, what free license means. You need an individual license agreement uh, that must be conducted with a copyright holder or any other um, right holder. But again, uh, we have a problem when it comes to scientific research and there might be some further regulations for scientific research. And um, it is also in the public interest that works protected by copyright may be, of course, re uh, used in, in context of education and science and research. And there um, we have, as, have special regulations where uh, the German legisl legislator has created the possibility of using copyrighted works on the basis of legal permissions without having the permission of the author. And I think this is quite interesting for us. And um, in the German copyright law, we can find these legal permiss permissions to use personal data and not personal data, copyrighted data um, for um, research purposes without having um, obtained any kind of, of permission, as I mentioned before, in Article 60C, where we have a special regulation for the use of copyrighted work for purposes of scientific research. And um, I will shortly introduce to you um, what this uh, scientific research paragraph contains in the German copyright law. So um, the law here, the 60C, distinguishes between two possibilities, whether one uses the materials for own research or whether these materials are made available to others. And we have there specific cases. For example, the law says for one's own scientific research, the German copyright law allows the duplication of up to 75% 
of a work without having obtained any permission before. But it is important to see that only reproduction in this case um, is, is permitted. So that means no alteration or something like that. So the production of an analog or digital copy. Then it is set in the law for other recipients. For example, when you use materials for teaching from any other persons, um, any other researchers, 50% of a work may be reproduced, distributed, or made publicly available online. But making publicly available online means that you still need a defined group of recipients um, of, the, of the work that is being reproduced here. So um, making publicly available online does not mean uh, making publicly available online to everyone in the World Wide Web. Um, and then the law says, thirdly, in addition, up to 15% of the copyrighted work may be made available to individual third parties if it, this serves to check the quality of the scientific research. So you see um, that the um, copyright um, or the scientific research um, permission reasons are quite, um, well, they, they are not as, as open as they are with regard to privacy law, but you see that copyrighted work might be used without having um, obtained any permission. But this is not the only case on how you can use um, copyrighted work um, without having obtained any permission before. There are several other reasons uh, that can be found um, in, the, in the copyright law. So, for example, when you think about using um, um, or publishing your own research results in some kind of paper, you have several possibilities from a legal perspective. So, firstly, um, you can um, publish the research results in open access. And open access means you make them available to everyone. The problem is here, um, open access costs a lot of money because normally uh, publishers want to sell their um, papers. And uh, when you say, or when you opt for open access, they normally say you have to pay 1,000 euros. Um, in some journals, it's about 2,000, it's about 2,500 euros to make the, article accessible for everyone without um, paying the journal. Um, for this reason, this is not really a good option for many researchers. And this is why um, a lot of uh, research results um, are published uh, under so-called open license. Um, I will um, define this a little bit later on what open license means, but open license, um, generally speaking, allow the public uh, under certain conditions, the free use of the work. So um, you can have a free um, free flow of your research results and you can, have, but you have the possibility to adapt the open license. So you can uh, set various conditions under the your research work might be further used. Another option would be um, to have, um, for example, if you want to publish a book, um, you need a publishing contract, normally with a publisher, and the publisher normally wants um, extensive rights of use. So he normally uh, wants to be the only person, uh, the only legal person who is allowed um, to, um, um, to use your work because he wants to make money with that. And uh, for this reason, the copyright law says there are two possibilities if publishers um, create a contract, creates a contract with you. So firstly, we can have a simple or an exclusive um, usage contract. And I will define this also on the next slide, what's the difference between simple and exclusive um, contracts. But uh, to go back to the open license. So open license means um, that they also allows the general public under certain conditions, the free use of the work. Um, so normally um, um, you have a, a license agreement um, that you um, create with certain persons um, or with certain publishers. But here, when you have an open license, um, you are not able to create a license with everyone in the World Wide Web, for example, that uses your research. So um, legally speaking, um, the contract here, the license contract occurs automatically through the use of the work of third parties. And there are several possibilities on how to create um, these, these open licenses. And the three most important uh, open or standard open licenses that you can find um, are the so-called Creative Common licenses, the CC licenses that can be found in many places in the World Wide Web. Um, and we in NFDI for Health um, have created um, a guideline um, on the use of these CC licenses uh, that can be found on our web website. So the different 
um, possibilities on how to merge different types of CC licenses, what the different types mean, and so on. We have the general public license, the GPL, as well as the digital peer publishing um, license. But the Creative Commons license is normally the most well-known standard open license that you can find. And um, open licenses are useful for researchers um, because they can be used in many kinds of um, applicational areas. And uh, they enable, as I mentioned before, the free um, flow of the knowledge without paying any additional fee for that. Um, when you conduct a publishing contract, and this would be the other possibility that you find a private company, a publisher, and co conclude a publishing contract with that company, um, you can allow as the author, the third party or any other any other user um, to, to use your um, research results, for example. And um, the contract partner receives this license, which is normally called the rights of use. And becomes the rights holder. And um, based on which kind of contract you have concluded, and um, you will see how extensive uh, the rights of use um, are here. And um, you can have a contract that is concluded between the user, that means an individual, an institution, and the rights holder, that means the author or any th other third party uh, with the right to the work, um, on the basis of which the use of the work is permitted in one or more ways. So when you conclude a contract, you are free to decide what should uh, contain the con what should be contained in the contract? Who should be able to use the contract? Um, how much is to paid, for example, as a fee um, um, by the by the um, publisher to you as a researcher to publish the contract uh, to publish your work and so on. And um, normally, um, because we have uh, the freedom of contract in Germany, um, for this license agreement, there is no certain legal form that's being prescribed but of course for like it is for every with every contract and um, the text form is uh, recommended here um, as well and as i mentioned at the beginning when it comes to the creation of uh, these license agreement we have to distinguish between exclusive and simple rights so the exclusive rights of use means that your contractual partner and this is normally the case with every publishing house um, that you even as an author are not able to use your work anymore. So you give the whole rights um, to the publishing house, to the publisher. And for example, the publisher creates a book out of it or creates a paper and sells this. So for this reason, you would not be able um, to use your data anymore freely. Um, if you um, grant simple use um, to the publisher, for example, you can also use um, your work again, and you can, for example, grant simple use to any other publisher. But normally, um, publishers are asking for exclusive rights of use. So you should, should really think before publishing um, um, your results in a journal, if this is, for example, the appropriate journal, um, or um, um, if it would be a better way um, to um, get the free flow of your research results and that uh, you have received possibly more citations um, when you do not grant um, exclusive rights of use, but only simple rights of use. And that means um, that the proliferation of research results by publishers, by scientific publishers, might not always be the best way um, when you have to grant an exclusive uh, rights of use so that you, you as an author are not even able to use your data any more properly and uh, to spread it uh, through the scientific community. This is important to consider before con uh, conducting um, a license agreement um, with regard to that. 